welcome to ProV TV. Something a little bit different for all you guys today, rather than my normal sort of techie videos, I've got an actual interview. So I've invited in Simeon from Vivida. How are you today? I am doing good, yeah, thanks for having me in. That's all right, no problem at all. So I guess let's start with who you are and what your company does. Yeah, Do you want to take it away? Sure thing. So um, unlike many of you, essentially um, I'm a shooter. I um, mm -hmm. started off as a, as a I'll call it a one-man band, you know, working mm -hmm. by myself, um, shooting some photo, also got involved in some, 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 a lot of video as well. Um, and the Grassroots Foundation originally um, was weddings. Mm. I started off a bit corporate, but it was as corporate as you can go when you're 19, 20. Um, sure. Mainly weddings, getting a little bit into that's the it. corporate side. Of that's it. I liked and enjoyed the predictability of knowing where my money was coming from, being able to go next year this time, in July, I can see three weddings yep. and I know I can, you know, feed myself, family um, and make stuff happen. That's actually one big plus about weddings which isn't talked about very often is yeah. that you're planned so far in advance, which is quite nice really. Definitely. Mm. I, it, it's a massive benefit sometimes. It just that business can be quite stressful. I'm sure a lot of your audience know that if you, if you work as a, as a freelancer, you are literally going from project to project, you, you, you shoot a project, you edit it, you look up and you go, what's next on the table? Mm -hmm. And then you scramble and try and find something else in. And I, mm -hmm. I had a very, very, uh, and, and it's many years ago now, I had a really bad patch um, doing some kind of more corporate website development, um, filming, editing. I got scared and I got into weddings. I then found that I loved weddings and I really enjoyed it at the mm. time. Um, and then um, we were called Unico Weddings back in the day, um, rebranded to Vivida as a strategy to get to where we are now, mm -hmm. which is um, we are essentially a storytelling agency uh, that uses video as the medium. We no longer shoot weddings. We shoot um, video for corporates, um, uh, corporations and companies. Um, and it ranges from um, people like Barclays, um, sometimes we're shooting with different agencies. We've done odds and ends for, for Mars, for Nestle. Um, uh, and, and some of it is quite visually exciting, but also a lot of it is day-to-day, -day, like corporate, you yeah. know, um, interview, B-roll material. Yeah. But the thing that we focus on as a business is not really just a shooting. So we're geared up now in a way that um, we help our customers um, understand strategy, um, which then influences the approach to the video. So we're not so much a production company, we're steering it uh, in more into an agency. So it means that through my um, shooting life, I've literally gone from starting off on a small 350D, mm -hmm. and gone now, <laughs> uh, current camera is a C300 Mark II. Um, I should say as well, I'm a Canon ambassador. Yeah, let's go uh, on to that. I'm an explorer on the ambassador program, so. Uh, How did you get started in that? I was just shooting, I was doing my thing. Mm. Um, I was really fortunate that when I was shooting wedding work, um, I was posting for Facebook and sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I was sharing behind the scenes content that was actually there to drive business. My hope was that a bride and groom would look at the work that was happening behind the scenes with some of the shoots we were doing for photo and for video. They would, they would get excited by it and mm. then they would get in touch. What actually happened was the audience was bride and grooms and their families, but it was massively attractive to photographers and videographers because they were seeing all of the process behind. Mm -hmm. Totally caught me off guard. Um, and as a result, you know, we enjoyed some really good interaction and peerage from the others within a, a, our kind of photo uh, video community. And Canon noticed that uh, and were following. And they followed secretly for a year didn't tell me, and they're like, we've well, been watching for a year. <laughs> yeah, they, then they made the approach. Um, I'm genuinely a Canon fan. Mm -hmm. um, I have been. Though, I'm assuming you were shooting on Canon. I was shooting that. Canon before. Absolutely. What so, were you shooting on? First camera was an XL1, XL2. Mm -hmm. When I was approached, it's probably a 5D Mark II and 5D Mark III. We were among the first in the country to go for uh, video. Um, with the DSLRs, yep. so that's really what kind of caught Canon's attention at the time. Is yep. um, I bought all the technology before the firmware update, which made the Mark II work with PAL, if you remember. Yes, that. it was um, only 30 frames a second. Exactly, it, yeah. and had all the tech there, and then I had a booking, 
and literally on the day the firmware came out, it ran in tandem with a wedding booking, and then all of a sudden everything really started to escalate because people mm. go, oh, how did you do that? How did you shoot a video that was, you know, in this way with this type of technology? Um, and it was great because we, we started to really engage with people and then help to give them some insight into how to work with the technology and how to tell the story, which was, which was always our focus, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and um, the honest truth is the reason I chose Canon in the beginning is purely because the camera looks nice. The, the <laughs> <laughs> That's the honest truth. I don't say that often. <laughs> but I, I was seduced by... The good looking cameras. By good looking camera, in the same <laughs> way that someone that was, what, 20 looked at a car and I liked the car because of the alloy mm -hmm. wheels. The Canon camera, the XL1 back in the day, had a white lens and I thought, that looks cool. It looks like it would send out the right message that I was professional, even though the truth was I bought the camera before I knew how to use it and how to mm -hmm. shoot. It's the way I sometimes work. I will invest, I put myself under a bit of pressure. I then learn how to use it, and then I go out to market, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I add that offering. So at the beginning, I looked at my Mac, I bought the Mac, sat it on the table, learned how to use it, and then right, right, what software can I use? And it had Final Cut Pro was an option. Um, seven, yeah, presumably. It was seven. Um, Photoshop, etc. And I went, right, I'm gonna learn how to do this video stuff. And then I bought the camera and I bought the software, mm -hmm. and I sat in my office going, right, I've got to learn how to use this over the next few months. And I did it, and gradually, bit by bit, mm -hmm. um, it turned into a profitable business. So I guess how long ago was that now? Uh, I say 10 years every year. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go with 10 years. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with 10 years. And the official line is v Vida as a corporation started in 2003, so that probably... Yeah, a bit longer than that now. 13 years. Yeah. But also. it was literally, I mean, when we talk about starting 2003, it wasn't really a we, it was me. It was a you. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, fast forward to now. Mm. So what are you using now? Now it's a C300 Mark II for the majority of the projects. That's um, your ACAM. That's my ACAM. Um, for my style of shooting, actually we don't, we avoid using too many two camera shoots. Mm -hmm. If I can shoot with two cameras, generally I will go and use another C300 Mark II, even if mm -hmm. I have to go and I have to rent it. Um, I've also got DSLRs because I hop in and out of photo. Most mm. of our obligations are video. Um, I would say I'm as strong at photo as I am video. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm stronger at photo, but from a business point of view, we decided at Vivida that we would have the strategy of being very, very clear to our target audience and going, this is what we do. And mm -hmm. so for me, that's video, but we will always get asked to do, with pho do photography. And of course, I'll say yes, because I love doing it. So for that, I use DSLRs. I'm comfortable with that. So um, 5Ds, um, I've got a 1DX Mark II. I got it as a pre-production camera. I never gave it back. Um, oh, yeah, hopefully Canon <laughs> don't watch this video and I'll the camera back. Um, so there are times. Though, isn't it? it is very it's cool. very nice. Um, uh, and there are... Cameras are tools. Sometimes you need a hammer, sometimes you need a, a chisel, and it's about choosing the right camera for the right job. Mm. Yeah. Cool, so what sort of projects have you been doing recently? I mean, you were mentioning something about a good shoot in Ghana. Yeah, um, it's one that we're just refining the edit on. Um, hopped, out to, hopped out to Ghana, we, we shot a, a project for, um, I'll call it an NGO, so essentially it's a bit like a charity, right. and it was one that was is essentially newly established. So um, we flew out um, with a shed load of a kit, shed load of equipment, <laughs> um, and started to um, you know, create and craft this content. I wanted to shoot as a solo shooter, um, essentially. Um, so I brought someone out for behind the scenes and also just to help me with the amount of luggage that I had. Mm. Um, but the main camera I shot with was actually a 1DX Mark II. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so why did you go down from the C300 to a 1DX for that one? In a way, I don't... Okay, so if you just say video, you're mm -hmm. right. You would say it's gone down from a C300 Mark II. I suppose, But yeah. actually, for what I was doing, it was the best tool for the job. Mm. Um, I needed to walk away with photo and video more or less at the same time. So as I was shooting a scene, I would need to make sure I walked away with stills and video to tell both stories. And I didn't want to have to keep changing. Because imagine... 
we, we would we were dropped in Ghana into the middle of a village. So to give you yep. uh, some context, um, landing Ghana in Accra, we drove for thirteen hours. <sighs> right? Yeah, it was a killer. Um, a thirteen hours across into rural villages. Yeah. No power, no electricity. When we got into the village, um, and I brought a lot of tech with me, but the, it was forty degree heat. But the moment I was rigged up, I wanted to be able to operate more or less the entire, you know, for hours at a time. So I, I took the 1DX Mark II, so I didn't have to go, okay, video camera, now I need to do still, let me put that down. Mm -hmm. And when it's, when it's dirty and it's hot, um, you don't really want to start putting your cameras down on the floor. No. Um, at the beginning, you're, you're judging the environment and the crowd. You've got to bear in mind that those that are, you're there with don't have a lot of food, Mm. They have no wealth whatsoever, and you're trying to work out, if you put cameras and equipment down, will you see it disappear? So at the time, my thought process was, I want to be able to have my camera on me, have it connected through an easy rig, and I would be able to just walk around the village recording this footage, telling the story without having to have too much auxiliary equipment with me. Turned out, the reality was, was that they were so poor, that if they stole a camera, there was no way for them to sell it. Yeah, what do they do with it? <laughs> what do they do with it? Because they can't even get out of the village in order to be able to get somewhere mm. where it has any commercial value, which was very humbling and very sad. Mm. Um, so what was the project? What was the aim? What, what were you making? So the aim was to create a small um, two to three minute video mm -hmm. that would introduce the world to this social enterprise, which for all intents and purposes, is a bit like a charity. Mm -hmm. Give people an idea as what what's the issue, and then what is the ask. Yeah. Um, so if you think of it really essentially as a as a charity style video, but with a Vivida twist on it in terms mm -hmm. of the approach. The twist was shooting it in a quite a high production value way. So we were shooting one DX Mark II. I was shooting four K. Mm -hmm. I wanted to shoot four K with slow mo as well. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the autofocus. Because the 1DX can do 60 frames a second? Can do 60 frames a second. 4K? So for me it was 50. Mm -hmm. um, we did a couple of sh a number of shots at um, 100 frames a second in 1080p. Mm -hmm. But the thing I particularly liked was having slow motion in 4K with touch screen. Mm -hmm. So I Makes was a using... a surprising difference, doesn't oh, it? Oh man, it was awesome. See, I had the full easy rig on, carrying it on a rig. Uh, and because I, I wanted that kind of fluid motion, right. I didn't want it to be rigid like a monopod. Um, again, I wanted to feel. I wanted a little bit of shake to it. Um, I wanted it to be a little bit dynamic. The right kind following. of shake. That's it. So to be able to um, ebb and flow with the movement between, let's say it was a young child that's in front of you, uh, and normally all I'm doing is as I'm moving forward, I'm changing, I'm moving the lens, and then if I move yep. back, and as I rock, I kind of link my hand. Yeah. Then the lens to my body movement. Yeah. But being able to just hold the camera, touch, move back and forth, and then the camera's doing the tracking, and then mm. I just touch on something else and, and touch onto something else. It was great. Um, I also used the Movi. So I flew out um, with, the, with the Movi M10, put the camera on the Movi M10, and I could do all of these kind of beautiful moving shots. And I remember there was a particular scene um, I had a girl walking with, uh, you know, what you'd expect it in deep in Africa, top of the head with only you know, uh, produce and raw materials on the top of the head. She had a really sorrowful face, um, and I walked in front of her, and I just, you know, I, I had the easy rig on, so I could let go, and I could go. I'm gonna film him. So okay, because no understanding of language, mm -hmm. uh, and she just kept her facial expression. She didn't respond. She just carried on walking. And I would then just lift up the, the, the Movi, and of course, because it's on the easy rig, the tension of the line, you know, catches it mm -hmm. tight. And then as I was walking, I would just touch on her face, and the face detection just locked on. And I could be walking back and forth. Um, and because I was also working in slow mo, I only needed the best two or three seconds, because those two or three seconds were becoming the six. Mm. Um, but again, that that's quite a challenge for autofocus. I mean, the more you slow it down, the more you're going to notice if it drops autofocus. Absolutely. That did was, it cope? It, it did 100% cope. Um, Good. <laughs> I, was, I was very surprised. Mm. I remember with the C300 Mark II, I was like, oh, autofocus would be awesome in slow-mo, but it can't be done. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. It cannot be done. And then they did that, and I was like, whoa, all right, it can be done. But surely in slow-mo, it's not going to be good enough. 
and mm. it was. I mean, I'm talking 50 mil sometimes shooting at 1.2 mm. touch, um, or I was shooting with 2.8. So I had Lee filters on the front, so that I could, because I wanted to shoot with a shallow depth of field. Mm. One of the things I get spoiled with, with say um, a, a C300 Mark II, is NDs built in. Yep. It would have been prime, you know, space for that camera. Bright, harsh sunlight, mm -hmm. um, you know, the 15 stops of, of, of dynamic range, it would have been perfect. NDs to get shallow depth for field, but I really needed a smaller package so that people weren't as intimidated at yeah, the beginning. Yeah, it make a big difference. Um, and then I also wanted to be able to shoot photo as well. Mm. Um, so that's why I decided on the 1DX Mark II. Mm. But to be able, then I added the NDs, that gave me the look that I wanted. So mm. it taught me something. Actually, sometimes you can modify the camera to get the kind of look and feel that you wanted. Mm. Um, one of the reasons I choose Canon, regardless of being an ambassador, um, is because of the colour. Mm. Like if you don't want to have to grade material, you can get the look straight out of camera. So the video that I currently got on the edit timeline, um, which I can't wait to get out there, it hasn't been graded. And I'm actually not going to grade it. Oh wow! We got it. I got it in camera. Do you know what gamma profiles and stuff like that you used? Can um, you remember? Yeah, I, I do. I went for neutral. Okay. So I went. Um, so if you go into the camera, you go to your profiles. Mm -hmm. I took it off of standard because mm -hmm. standard is very, very rich. It's very but punchy. Very punchy, but it makes your blacks like black. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have a little bit of leeway if I needed to in post. You can't make black any blacker than black. So um, I wanted just a little bit of flatness there. Also, I was in an environment that was very rich in colour. I didn't need and external help. as well. And contrast. Very harsh, harsh sunlight. Exactly. So going to neutral, which was as flat as it goes in the camera, mm -hmm. um, was all I needed. Um, I've done a shoot more recently back in Ghana um, with Canon. I chose a C300 Mark II. I shot that in C-Log2 and I had to grade every shot. Absolutely. It was great because I had that flexibility but there was more time involved in the edit. Mm. Sometimes grading is not necessary, mm. you know, because... And log's not necessary sometimes. And log's not I mean, always necessary. It's a tool. It is a tool, and you have to decide when to use it and when not yep. to. Yep. Um, and because I've got both options, I can go, oh, actually, you know, I go down the technical route, and I go, oh, 15 stops of dynamic range, and I'm this much data rate, etc. and I want to be able to do this. But when it comes down to it, the thing that is actually really important to me, getting the end result, Quickly, on time, and on budget. And we all know budgets change and vary depending on the nature of the project. Yep. So sometimes you want to be able to shoot and walk away with it in camera, knowing you've got it. And when you're shooting with an LCD screen or um, you know, a, a, a Shogun or a small mm -hmm. HD, you haven't really got that much excuse because you can see the freaking image on the screen. You know mm -hmm. if you're overexposed. Yeah, you've got um, tools, you've got waveforms, you've got... Zebras, all of that stuff. You've got all of that material. Um, so that becomes really useful. I did shoot with an external monitor when I was in Ghana shooting mm -hmm. with the 1DX Mark II. Um, I, I chose a small HD mm -hmm. and primarily the, because I had a hood for it. Which one? The 702? I had the DP... Is it a DP? Oh, DP7. 7, seven. Mm. yep. Um, so it hasn't died. It, it just keeps living. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're made very, very well. Oh, they're brilliant, yeah. So... Uh, HDMI straight out. It was also great because everyone who was watching me shoot, all the kids, they could actually see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And that's really important when you see this. this get them a bit enthusiastic. Get them enthusiastic. Yeah. You, they see you with this easy rig with a camera. And I mean, I was really fully pimped up because <laughs> I. <laughs> walking like Iron Man. I, I'm walking like Iron Man because <laughs> I did not want to compromise on the look. I was like, damn, mm -hmm. it's got to be a bit Vivida, right? So. I need to have a slightly different approach. I didn't want to go in there with, I, I could have chosen, you know, one of the, the Canon sort of small broadcast cameras and the XS305 or something like that. It's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go there, out there and do it differently, which meant fully rigging up. The screen meant that they could see what I was doing and then, oh yeah, you look great. Just carry on. And after a while, this environment became a moldable, malleable kind of um, environment that I could craft the mold to get what I needed in terms of the, the end shots. Um, so I particularly enjoyed that. I would say for most of my productions, I'm definitely a C300 Mark II person. Mm. Um, it's definitely my, my camera of, of choice. Um, I love the autofocus. Um, that's a really big, Im important thing for me. And I love the look. 
The brand for Vavid has been rebranded recently. In fact, I did that this week. We rebranded and relaunched. And there's a couple of videos on there and you see it. And, you know, it's got a really nice production value to it that I'm really proud of. And it's because I've been able to go through the range from, you know, can Canon cameras kind of all the way up through DSLRs to these bigger cameras, which give me the look that I need. And whether it be the video on there that's the, the called the Leap of Faith of the England Hurdler, um, or the recent video that we did, which was um, a personal project for a company that employed blind within the business. Oh, um, right. I wanted a really good, beautiful aesthetic to it. And I wanted mm -hmm. that flexibility and control as we were shooting in post. Um, and that, that camera gives it to me. Um, but because I need audio, it has you know, XLR inputs. It's got those things that I need on a day-to-day -day basis. There's some things which if you're doing a real video project, which is a normal video project, mm. you just can't do without. That's it. It's, for me, the camera's got flexibility. The price was, the, the price point was definitely higher at the beginning. Mm. It's, it's been bought down, which is, yep. which is thumbs up, which is, which is great. We all like to spend less money on things. Um, but I think the, can, the camera that Canon designed there was a camera that they looked at what features do most people need to use on a day-to-day -day basis, and those were the things that they prioritised, and they wanted those elements to work 100%. And the um, C300 has always been a workhorse camera. It's yeah. not been a feature-rich camera. It's not been one that gets people going and going, oh, yeah, this new feature. Yeah. It's just a workhorse. It's dependable, reliable, turn up on every shoot, does exactly what you want it to do. Agree. So it is that workhorse, but now they did add some really cool features mm. like the um, focus guides I yeah. really got into that particularly yeah. because there's a couple of projects that we did that we used the cine primes so I, I went down a nutty route um, recently we did a shoot for Unilever for a hackathon so it was essentially a, a live event it was as close to the wedding days as I get when I'm working <laughs> in the corporate environment it was like a two-day event uh, for Unilever um, with 200 people there, I was like, okay, I'm kind of back in my zone again, you know, like, mm -hmm. like the, the good old days. But I decided to shoot this with Cine Primes, which you would normally think is like a, do not mm -hmm. do it on a live event. I decided to go easy rig again, because I was like, okay, I did that in Ghana, I really liked the kind of the feel of it. Um, but you don't get autofocus with Cine Primes. I was like, do I go down the route of Cine Primes or do I go for L series lenses, which have got that autofocus within the lens, but I thought, no, I want to go for the Cine Prime. One, because to the client, it's going to look great. And they're like, they saw the mm -hmm. set of lenses, and they're like, wow, you guys mean business. Already, they then went, we need to talk to you about another project. I was like, great. That rental, for me, it was rental, was, it's already paid off, because it looked the part. Now, let me work with these things. <laughs> but it was great, because I actually, I ebbed and flowed out of, you know, focus went in and out. It was very rich being able to work at, um, with T stops, you know, T 1.4, 1.3 was was fantastic, and having that element of control with follow focus, but having focus guides helping you work out when you've got it. I call it focus compensation. So Canon, could you change the name <laughs> of the feature to um, what did I just call it? Focus compensation. That's I think the wrong it's a good word. Term. No, 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 not compensation. No? The term that I had, focus confirmation. Oh, I see. Right, focus confirmation. Yes. For me, the focus guides confirm that you have it in focus. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a guide because it kind of guides so you. So you don't have to do that little wiggle. You don't and have to do you the don't wiggle. Go a little bit out of focus. Oh no, I was in focus. Let's go. Exactly. Back. You still find you do a little bit of that, but mm -hmm. at least you know I've got it, and you go right. But I I've guess got once it. you get used to using the focus guide, you don't need to. You yes. sort of go, I guess when you're not used to using it, you still do that because it's. You're so used to using it. Yeah, you, that. you get it into position. And mm -hmm. with those lenses, the great thing is, is you, the control is so precise, you just literally roll the lens around and then mm. ease it and you've got it. It goes green, the little box goes green and you're, you're on you're there. It's, it, it's kind of there and it, it's going. So um, that's good. Also with the new firmware update, the C300 Mark II has become a much better camera overall. C-Log3. I love C-Log3. C-Log3 is cool because you can shoot with it and you almost get that look where it's kind of graded, but you've got that latitude in the dynamic I range. I just find it so end. much easier to grade. It's a lot easier to grade. Um, and there's times when I haven't graded it. 
Yeah. C log two, you need to grade it, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Because especially if you're in a cine gamut, it, it it really really is flat. It's very flat. No color. With this, you get the punch at the bottom end, but then you get the highlights. Uh, you probably just want to boost the saturation, because yeah. the way the gamma curves work is that by bringing the blacks down um, and then in, you know bringing the highlights, generally, yeah, normally is up. Um, you're increasing the saturation as you pull mm -hmm. in in either direction. Um, when you don't grade it, you don't get the saturation increase, so you always have to dial that in if you're going to go down the route of pretty oh. much not grading C log three. But C log two is actually the thing that now excites me more. Oh, C log really? three, yeah, because um, so originally the feedback was from um, ambassadors like myself, but also those who had the camera, was that the colour profile was noisy in C log two in the shadows, mm -hmm. and it was because we weren't exposing correctly with that that, that log curve. For mm -hmm. me, being honest with you, coming from the DSLR revolution where it's WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, mm -hmm. you kind of you, 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 and then you move to C-Log and you get an understanding that you're going to shoot for the middle grey, like the 18% grey, leaving yourself some latitude in, in either direction. You try and do something similar with C-Log 2, it does not work for you because your blacks are not where they need to be. Um, in fact, the honest truth is the hurdler video, the leap of faith that you see on the Canon website and also on our own website, I shot it wrong. Really? I shot it wrong. Um, Which I, way? What did you do? So what we did it, I, I will say that it was a pre-production camera yeah. and I had it for <laughs> for literally one day, one or two days. I've and done the same thing. no one was <laughs> really knew how to work with C-Log2 uh, back then. So what I did is I was shooting um, England hurdler Gabriel Odujobi. Mm. And, and he's a darker man, a bit like myself, just a little bit darker, right? Mm -hmm. And what I did is I, I shot him um, and recorded him where his skin tone where it should sit right. on the scale, right? If you imagine the histogram on the waveform monitor. So I shot his skin tone so it was where it would naturally sit. When you're shooting, When not I was in log. shooting. Or in, ca in the original Canon log. In C log 2. So you imagine um, I shoot his skin tone, and let's say that um, zero is blacker than black, crushing it. So what yep. did I shoot? I probably shot him about 90, okay. for example. Which way round is it? 90's Not 90, high. 90's up. So imagine 10. I shot it at five, 10, right? Which is low. Which is low, because <laughs> it looked great in the camera. I got mm. it onto the editing timeline, I was like, yeah, the highlights were fantastic. They were way in, and I mean like way in, even though you could see outdoors. But I realised there was noise. I was like, fucking hell, what the heck, new camera, noise, mm -hmm. noise. And what I had done is I had shot it so low that what I needed to do is I needed to take those shadows, and I needed to bring them down so that his skin tone was bought from where it should have been to where it should yeah. actually be on the end grade. But because I shot him here and it was noisy, the moment I pushed it down, he was blacker than black. Yeah. I mean, you, it was literally eyes and teeth, right? <laughs> not what I wanted. <laughs> so, not the look you were going for. Not no. the look I was going for. <laughs> um, and I realized I should have shifted it. Luckily, because of the data rate, um, because of the, the, the quality of the codec, you can't tell in the grade, but it wasn't the easy thing for me to do. So what do you do now? How do you expose now? Do you expose now how work? I expose, focus on the highlights. Yeah. Really focus on the highlights. I, I get those shadows way up. Because you can overexpose everything. You can really, overexpose. And then bring everything back And down. you can bring it down and still retain detail in yep. those highlights. I mean, don't flatline it, don't yep. blow it out, but be aware that there is so much latitude in that top end, that yeah. you bring the you bring their shadows down to where they should be, and We've sort of leave the highlights alone for the and most sort of part. leave the highlights yeah. alone exactly. Yeah. Whereas C log three, mm, it's different. You mm. you actually I, I personally feel you almost shoot C log three, where it should be. Yeah. Because when you so push middle it, exposed exactly, you push it down, but only a fraction. Yeah. Right. Um, so it, the, the key thing is understand your camera, experiment, yep. and have a play with it. Yep. Um, it's like Very if you're going to drive a sports car, um, even though you're used to driving, don't expect to buy a new car, take it straight out on the track and be able to get the most of it. You yep. need to understand the nuances, you need to understand where it's going to, you know, a, a Formula One car is a Formula One car, it's awesome. But if you drive it around the corner in slightly the wrong way, the tail will spin out. You've got to understand how to keep it on the track. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that, um, that's key with cameras as well. Right, so you did a Facebook Live just before we started filming this, yes. where <laughs> you asked uh, your followers on Facebook uh, some questions. Now, what were they? Remind me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> do you have your phone yeah, on I you? Yeah, I do. Um, I believe one of them was about 4K. Yes. Okay, so this question came in, and the question is, um, is it important to shoot 4K for all projects? Is, like, is 4K my daily um, kind of shooting mode? Um, and I would say that it's... I shoot 4K as much as possible, particularly for what I do is I look at the, the productions that are going to last and be online beyond six months. Yeah. If the lifespan is there and it's going to sit either in my portfolio or my client's portfolio for any period of time, then I want to shoot 4K. Yeah. Um, 4K isn't absolutely necessary now. No, it's not. Yeah. It, it's not a need now. It's great to have it because you can, there have been some projects where we've, we've essentially recropped we've reframed or I've added stabilization and because I've got so much data there in terms of the pixels, it's done that amazingly and I've still had a really great, amazing quality to it. Um, I've got a, um, a file there where my raw file, or sorry, my end encode is 4K when then I, from that derivative, I then do my 1080Ps mm-hmm. and in the future I can go back and go, I love that project, let me put it back online in 4K. I do that for key personal projects, but I do work out is it necessary um, and th- is it cost effective? Yeah. It's not always cost effective to shoot 4K. Yeah, um, I mean, you've got four times storage space. Storage space, memory cards, etc. So it's power. a decision that we make on a day by day basis depending on what we are shooting. But for Vivida, um, there are a number of productions that we will do. And ironically, actually, it's mostly our own personal projects mm. that we will always want to shoot in 4K. So we've got that capability. Sometimes well, you want them to look it. as good as you possibly can. That's it. Because what you create is a reflection of the brand. The, the one thing, actually, I would say is um, 1080p on a DSLR is totally different to 1080p on a C300 Mark II. Yeah. Um, so I'm much happier to shoot C300 Mark II in 1080p because you, you're taking that beautiful quality from a 4K sensor and the 1080p is flipping sharp. Yeah. It looks fantastic. Really nicely downscaled. Absolutely. Whereas if I'm shooting a DSLR, I'm often shooting 4K and down converting yeah. uh, to get that same... To get the same look. If you go put it into, it's got a down sample it and line skip and stuff like that. You've got it. You've got exactly. it. So. Yeah. Um, different approach for different cameras. Yeah, um, Com- comes back to what you were just talking about, know your camera and know which way to get the best results out of it. Definitely. Um, so, you know, there's a, th- there's a plethora of different cameras out there at the moment um, and it is all about getting the balance. I try, not be, I try not to be too seduced by looking at all of the technological features on the camera. I try and work out what are the features that we will use what are the features that my clients will be able to see on screen? Mm-hmm. And what features actually make my job easier mm-hmm. in order to be able to get it done? And you'd be surprised when you ask those three questions, you sometimes realize that certain things are not absolutely necessary or something that you thought was not gonna be that important is a bigger deal than you thought. Like for me, autofocus yeah. is that thing. Yeah, you know, I've got a way of not using it before. Well, my client, to be able to tell that I'm shooting autofocus, no, they cannot. Can I tell when I'm shooting it? Does it mean that I can shoot quicker? Mm. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Now, another question that came up on your Facebook Live, which I quite liked, was the whole lights versus camera debate. If you had to pick one, good camera or good lights, to take with you on a project, but you could only pick one, which would you take? Oh, that's a very, very difficult It's very difficult, question. isn't it? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll put it in a different way, because you can get away with, to a certain extent, either or. Mm. But in order for any camera to work properly, light is the key thing. And exactly. light is the thing that you, you, if you want to have very high production value, often it's the angle of light that is Mm. exceptionally important in order to be able to make things work. Even if you work natural light, you need a really good quality of light. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to think that even if I had a um, very, very basic camera, I would be able to make something look good if the light 
is correct. Um, but the camera, but then at the same time, if you don't have great light, it's going to be a certain grade of camera that's going to be mean that you can carry on doing what you do even in those difficult circumstances. Yeah. Um, I think I become interested in different things at different times. I go through certain phases. Yeah. Sometimes for me it is, oh my God, it's light that is the most important thing to me and I get really excited by it. And other times it is the camera um, and the lenses. Um, I massively like light and I like shaping it and I really enjoy creating it. It depends actually on your own personal style. If you're going to mm -hmm. be shooting available light, so light that yeah. is already there in a scene, then actually a really good camera is massively a, a big priority. Yeah. If you're in a setup that's more, let's say, very, very controlled, yeah. you can get away with not shooting beyond ISO 800 because you're in control of the light. So it's really down to the type of shooting style that you have um, and the type of project that you, that you take on. Cool. Well, I think it's a good way of thinking about it. Cool. All right. Thank you very much for talking to us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for cool. hanging out. Thank you for watching. Um, and make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. It really, really does help us out. I'll see you in the next wait, video. Wait, wait, wait. Oh? Can I just say that um, we've got our own YouTube channel oh, as well? Oh, of course, Is yes, because right? you've joined me in no. the YouTube world. Plug, you plug, need, plug. need to get those plugs in. <laughs> yeah, um, some of the things that we've been speaking about um, are on, I've set up a new YouTube channel, yes. which is Simeon Quarry. I'm sure can, we can leave a little note. Um, yep, yep, I'll in put in links to it. I'll watch some of it. It's great. Yeah, so it tends to be not as much on based on the technology I, mm -hmm. I love why i love your channel because you kind of give me an Great understanding technology. of technology and the lights <laughs> etc some of the things we look at you know how important are passion projects um how do you get around uh, difficult situations where things go wrong on a shoot mm. um, how do you get the kit that we see around us on a plane yes um, to a location that was your most recent video most i think wasn't it i watched that one yeah. so um if any of those type of things are of interest then definitely uh, hit me up on the youtube channel leave some questions and, and get involved. Definitely, I highly recommend it. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs>